Good day, dear doctors, and welcome to this short module on common fungal infections that will most likely come out in your board exams. Now, we're going to begin this short module by zooming in to a very important fungi, which carries a very high morbidity and mortality and carries a very high possibility of coming out in the boards. So this is mucor mycosis. So let's zoom in by converging the following references. So we will be using Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine, 20th edition, and the bulk of this talk will be from chapter eight on infectious diseases uh, on the 10th edition of Robbins and Cotran, Pathological Basis of Disease. And lastly, one of our Bibles in microbiology, that's Jowitz, Melnick, and Adelberg's Medical Microbiology. Now, let's begin by giving an, a quick overview of what mucormycosis is. So for nomenclature purposes, mucormycosis is caused by the fungi which belongs to the order mucoralis, hence the term mucor. Now, mucoralis, okay, the order mucoralis basically belongs to the subphylum, which was previously known as zygomycetes, and it's now called mucoromycotina. Now, for examination purposes, you actually don't have to exert that much effort remembering these tongue twisters, but take note that it used to be class zygomycetes. Now, a very important feature about mucormycosis is it's a highly invasive and relentlessly progressive disease. It carries a very high mortality rate and a high morbidity rate. So this fungi kills. Now, a busy table with a handful of tongue twisters lifted from Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. So basically it shows you the following families. Okay, mucor, lichthyme, Cunningham, Thamni, Mortier, Saxina, Saxina, and Synsaphila. Now of all of these families mentioned here, now I'm gonna go straight to the tip. Do not memorize everything. Just go straight to the family Mucoraceae and take note of Rhizopus because clinically the most common okay, genus that causes mucormycosis is gonna be Rhizopus or Mucor. So just remember these two genus, Rhizopus and Mucor. Everything else you can leave behind for the exam. Now here is a figure showing you how mucor looks. So basically you have to compare it with aspergillus. So the fungal forms of mucormycosis, as you can see here, are broad and they are non-septate. So I would like to remind you, they are broad, and they are non-septate. So please take note of that, broad and non-septate. While uh, the fungal forms of the spergillus are basically wider, so they are wider and they branch irregularly. So for mucor, what you bring with you to the exams is they are broad and they are non-septate, okay? Now, who are the people who will most likely develop mucormycosis? So number one on the list, we have diabetes. So please remember this by heart, okay? So diabetes, that's number one on the list. We have patients who basically have defects in phagocytic function. So that would include patients with neutropenia or patients who are on prolonged glucocorticoid or steroid use, as well as patients who have elevated free iron. Now, let me explain why patients with elevated free iron levels are predisposed to these fungal infections. It is because the fungus will require and utilize free iron to help support its growth. 
So there are some conditions where you might encounter patients with elevated levels of free iron, particularly those on hemodialysis, patients receiving multiple blood transfusions, or patients who have uh, diseases of iron metabolism, such as hemochromatosis. So again, who are the people at risk? Number one is the diabetics, those who have defects in phagocytic function, and patients who have elevated levels of free iron. Now, this is mentioned in the textbook, and I want everyone to take note of this, okay? So deferoxamine. So I mentioned earlier patients on dialysis or patients with renal failure. Now, one of the iron overloaded patients will be patients who have end-stage renal disease. Now, you have to remember that there is an iron chelator for the human host, and this is deferoxamine. What happens is uh, the fungal siderophore will utilize okay, uh, iron and basically help support the growth of the fungus, particularly mucor. Now, another condition wherein you would encounter a high risk of mucormycosis is patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, if this is the exam, just memorize DKA and ESRD patients. Now, these are the clinical syndromes for mucormycosis. There are about six mentioned in the textbook. So first is the rhino orbital cerebral, which means it affects the nose, the eyes, and the brain, the pulmonary, the cutaneous, the gastrointestinal, the disseminated, and the miscellaneous, which is basically going to be explained before we end. Now, of these six clinical syndromes, for examination purposes, memorize rhino orbital cerebral because this is the most common. So if this was an examination, you would expect or anticipate this to be asked. What is the most common clinical syndrome for mucormycosis. So it's rhino orbital cerebral. This comprises about 80 to 90% of the cases. So let's isolate the most common first, which is the rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis. Now the usual initial symptoms of rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis is the patient will complain of pain either in the face or pain in the eye. Then we have the facial numbness. They can also present with orbital manifestations, particularly conjunctival suffusions and blurring of vision. Now, very important is this, only half of patients with rhinoorbital cerebral mucormycosis would present with fever. And this is the winner for the exam. Patients, So this is the winner. Patients with rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis have an increased risk of developing cavernous sinus thrombosis. Now, they can also present with manifestations of cavernous sinus thrombosis, which would include, number one, we have their bilateral proptosis, okay? There's chemosis, there's visual loss, and there's ophthalmoplegia. Now, I hope everyone remembers what the cavernous sinus is. So inside the cavernous sinus, you're going to see cranial nerve number three. You're going to see cranial nerve number four. So this is the ocular motor. This is the trochlear. And you're gonna see cranial nerve number six, which is the abducens nerve. Now remember that these three cranial nerves are responsible for the extraocular muscles. Okay, they innervate the extraocular muscles. So if there's cavernous sinus thrombosis, these three cranial nerves will be affected. Therefore, the EOMs will not be functioning. So your patient presents with ophthalmoplegia. Now, another cranial nerve found in the cavernous sinus is basically the first branch of trigeminal one, that's V1, and the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is V2. And this will explain why there is facial pain as well as facial numbness. So it all boils down going back to your neuroanatomy, okay? So please 
take note of this. Okay, so I hope everyone got this. Okay, now, next. This is a downloaded photo, okay? Courtesy of Gupta et al. showing you mucormycosis. So this is classic rhino orbital cerebral. I just want everyone to remember this point here. This is the bridge of the nose. You have here the angle of the nose. So if you remember in basic anatomy, we have what we call the dangerous triangle of the face. Okay, so there's communication with the facial vein, there's communication with the ophthalmic vein, and this will drain directly into the cavernous sinus. So any infections in this area, you always think of cavernous sinus thrombosis, okay, or CST. So this is a life-threatening disease because it basically reaches the cerebral sinuses. As you can see here, there's the famous black discharge. There's necrosis of the nose, structures in the face, and there's also black discharges there aside from the necrosis that you see. There's periorbital swelling here. Now, as you can see here, so you have the ophthalmoplegia, so here, so if you remember inside the cavernous sinus is cranial nerve three, cranial nerve four, and cranial nerve six. So cavernous sinus thrombosis presents with ophthalmoplegia. So here, picture down here, the patient can look to the left lateral. So the left lateral rectus is intact, but the patient cannot look medially. So this is a left medial rectus palsy here. So the stronger muscle, yeah, the one that's intact will pull the muscle towards that direction, as you can see here. So of all of the forms, clinical syndromes, you have to remember You have to remember rhinocerebral because it is the most common. So this is the reason why we're isolating this syndrome first, the rhino orbital cerebral. Now, we also have the disseminated and the miscellaneous form of the disease. So always remember that in the disseminated and the miscellaneous form of the disease, the mucor infection usually originates from a primary site of infection and can disseminate hematogenously to different sites, particularly the brain. So for examination purposes, take note that the most common site of dissemination is the brain. Other body sites may be affected, such as the bones, the mediastinum, the trachea, the kidneys, and the peritoneum, particularly in patients who are on peritoneal dialysis. Now, the mortality rate of disseminated mucormycosis can exceed as high as 90%. So this is a red flag for the clinician, and this is a red flag for you in your exams. Now, as for the treatment, the antifungal treatments, so I would like to remind everyone that for the first line antifungals, we can give amphotericine, okay? We can give amphotericine, and that's the only thing I want you to memorize on the first line therapy. Now, the disadvantages is it's highly toxic, and it has poor CNS penetration. So if you have a patient with uh, CNS penetration, then amphotericin B would not be your first choice. Okay, amphotericin B would not be your first choice. So we have the ABLC, okay, we have the ABLC. So this is a formulation of your 
and put kerosene. So this stands for amphotericine B lipid complex. Okay, amphotericine B lipid complex. So please take note of that. So amphotericine B lipid complex. So here, amphotericine B lipid complex. It is less nephrotoxic than amphotericine B. However, the downside is it's quite expensive. Now for the second line treatment, for mucormycosis, okay, I just want you to remember these two drugs. You don't have to memorize the dose. So we have Isa, fuconazole, and Posa, conazole. So for examination purposes, what is the first line antifungal therapy for the treatment of mucormycosis? We give amphotericin B. So amphotericin B. Now, for those who have uh, CNS involvement or disseminated CNS, so we go for the li liposomal amphotericine because this has better CNS penetration. For the second line, so we basically have ISA, fuconazole, and POSA, conazole. So this basically ends our module on mucormycosis. Please take time to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like the video, share the video, and most especially, go over the video for your examination. So see you as you crack the boards and best of luck and God bless on your examinations. This is Doc Toom saying thank you.